Good morning, and let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just come into your presence once again this week. Acknowledging your care for us this past week. Acknowledging that you walk beside us. Acknowledging that we need to lay our hearts at your feet so that you can take them and you can change them and transform them and make them hearts that beat in unison with your heartbeat so that we become the sort of people that represent you well. Lord, that is my prayer for each person here, that that really will be the desire of our hearts, that we will no longer be satisfied with just going through the motions of being Christians, but that we will actually desire heart transplants so that we become people who are like you. That is my prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello. Good morning. Welcome. How's everybody? Good? Good week. Did y'all get some rain? You probably got more rain than we got. Did you guys get rain on the east side? I heard the north about the bridge. Got quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we got some. We got rain last night. Yeah, it rained last night. So. Yeah, which is good. We need the rain. Not complaining. Well, and that's all that matters. Well, we're glad that you're all here. Uh, as you know, we're, we're coming up on the end of the year. It's not too far away, just a few weeks away. How about that? And then we'll be into 2025. Yeah, yikes. Genesis, we are st still continuing, and we probably will do Genesis through the end of this year, probably. Um, we may go into next year, but I think we'll start Exodus next year. I haven't fully figured it all out yet, but at any rate, Genesis, and today we're doing Jacob, the early years. So, last week, we introduced Jacob and Esau, who were the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And can any of you remember some of the differences between Esau and Jacob? Do you remember any differences? Esau is the firstborn. Okay, Esau firstborn, which obviously makes Jacob secondborn. Yeah. What, are, what were some other characteristics about them that made them? Because they were twins, but clearly not identical. He's, he's hairy. Okay, hairy. The Bible says he was hairy like a garment. That is a serious hairy baby. Jacob was not. Um, Esau had red hair. We know that. What, are, what other differences? What other things that 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 made them? Esau is kind of like more like a manly man. Okay, Esau was more of a manly man sort of a guy, the kind of a the kind of a son that every father hopes for, and Jacob was domestic. Maybe. Domestic. <laughs> okay. Uh, he, he was more, perhaps, of a homebody. Uh, certainly somebody that a mother could love, and that's where we get another significant difference because Isaac showed significant favoritism toward Esau, and Rebecca showed significant favoritism toward Jacob, and that's never gonna end well when that happens. So we dive more now into Jacob's story. Esau, he sort of plays a bit part. We hear about him, we'll hear about him in this story today, uh, but then we don't hear about him at all uh, until an, a, an another encounter with Jacob in about 20 years' time, and then that's, 
that's pretty much all we hear about Esau for the most part. We do hear about his descendants, the Edomites. The Edomites will be a thorn in the side of Israel for a really long time. Uh, but Esau, it's, it's, the story is no longer about him. We are really augering down into Jacob's story. The rest of Genesis will be about Jacob and his descendants for the most part. So this is what the Andrews Bible Commentary says. Conflict, tension, faith, and finally reconciliation are key themes in Jacob's story. Caught between a father committed to following tradition and a mother who had heard God's voice and schemed to help God along, the son of the blessing experienced numerous mountaintops and valleys as he grew into the man who would become Israel. And here's our scripture today. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So, Genesis chapters 27 and 28 are the, are the scriptures that we will cover. Jacob, the early years. So as we noted last week, Esau was not suited to receive the birthright. Not because he wasn't the firstborn son, but because of the, the looseness with which he held the birthright, the fact that he had intermarried with Canaanite women, and at this point he had two wives, and the very fact that he sold his birthright for so little demonstrated how little value he placed on it. And because the birthright in connection with Abraham and his descendants, it also had to do with covenant. And so Esau had really proven that he was not the man for the job, but Isaac was absolutely determined that Esau would have the birthright blessing. Isaac was now old, the Bible says, and blind, and he was concerned that his death was imminent. But you know what? The truth of the matter is he lived for at least another 40 years. But he thinks, I'm old. I'm probably going to die any day now. So it's probably a good idea to deal with this birthright blessing. What's interesting about this is that he called Esau, but he didn't bother to call Jacob or Rebekah. So it would appear as though he is trying to get his own way by simply not including the whole family in this process. So he calls Esau, says, son, I'm old, I'm going to die any day now. So take your weapons and go out in the fields and do what you do best and bring me back some wild game. Prepare a savory meal for me and I will give you the birthright blessing before I die. So Rebecca overhears this conversation. She's listening in to Isaac's conversation with his favorite son, so she goes to her favorite son and says, son, we're going to do something different. So Esau heads out. He's got his weapons. He's going to go hunting. And Rebecca calls Jacob over and she says, look, son, I overheard your father's conversation with Esau. He's about to bestow the birthright blessing on him. So listen carefully, son. Go to the flock and bring me two young goats. I will pre prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. You then take that food into your father 
and he will give you the birthright blessing. Now notice how Jacob responds. He said, but mother, Esau is hairy and I am not. What if father wants to touch me? He will know that I am not Esau and he'll think I am trying to trick him. Do you notice what he just said? Because what is his intent? Deception. To trick him. <laughs> right? So he's like, Mother, this isn't going to work because although we're trying to trick Father, we don't want him to think that we're trying to trick him. So if he feels me and touches me and knows I'm not hairy, he's going to think I'm trying to trick him, which I am trying to trick him, but I don't know that I'm trying to trick him. I don't want him to know that I know that he's trying to trick him. You understand what I'm saying? Does that, is that a silly thing to say? But don't we do that? Don't as humans, don't we do that? We want, there's something that we want. We know that, or we think we know that we can't get it through honest means. So we go about it trying to get what we want through deception, but we don't want the people that we're trying to deceive to think that we're deceiving them. So Jacob is a fine example of just humanity. Great observation, son, Rebecca replies, but don't worry about it. Just do as I tell you to do. Let the curse fall on me. So Jacob did as he was told. Meanwhile, Rebecca got some of Esau's best clothes out of the laundry. And then when the meal was ready, she put those clothes on Jacob and then covered his exposed bits with goat skin. And so now we have a guy that smells like Esau, feels like Esau, but is not Esau. And now he's ready to go into Isaac. And he comes into the tent and he says, Father? And of course, Isaac being blind says, who's there? And he says, <coughs> It's me, Esau. I have brought you my, your favorite meal, Father. Please come and sit down and eat and give me your blessing. And Isaac pauses for a second and he says, Man, you're back really quickly. He says, Yes, Father. Yahweh has given me success. Come here so I can touch you. Isaac says, so that I can know for sure that you're Esau. So somewhere there's a little niggle in the back of Isaac's mind that's saying, this is not right. There is something not right about this. So Jacob went, and Isaac touched him, and he says, you sound like Jacob, but you're hairy like Esau. And there's a major disconnect going on in Isaac's mind. You sound like one son. You feel like the other son. Are you really who you claim to be? Yes, Father. And so Jacob came close and kissed Isaac. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of the fields which Yahweh has blessed. Now may God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. And so Jacob received the birthright blessing. The Bible says that he had barely left Isaac's tent when Esau came in from the hunt. He prepared a tasty meal and took it to Isaac. Father, I'm back. Sit down and eat and give me your blessing. Who are you? 
Why not Esau, your firstborn son? And now the Bible says that Isaac begins to shake uncontrollably. Because his next words are this, who was it then that just brought me a tasty meal? I ate it before you came and gave the blessing to him, and he will surely <coughs> receive the blessing. <coughs> so even though Isaac in the back of his head's going, there is something not right here. Have any of you ever experienced that where you're just going, something is not right? And you talk yourself out of that that little niggle that's going, er. well, that's what happened here. With a bitter cry, Esau exclaimed, bless me too, father. And Isaac says, I can't do it. Your brother deceived me and took your blessing. And Esau says, man, you named him correctly, that heel grabber. He has deceived me twice. He took the birthright, and now he has taken the blessing. Haven't you got an extra blessing for me? Now is, his, is, now, is Esau's statement completely true? Not exactly. No, it's not. Because did he really deceive Esau to get the birthright? No, no he did not. What did he do? They bargained. He bargained. Do you really think he coerced him? I mean, was Esau really starving to death? Let's let's clarify that. Was he really going to fall dead on the ground if he didn't get a bowl of stew? No. Jacob played him by saying, "Yeah, I'll give you some food." in exchange for your birthright, but could Esau have just as easily said, are you out of your mind? I'm, I'm bigger and hairier than you are. I want that stew and you will give it to me, right? This, that scenario could have played out several different ways. So, so Esau wasn't com being completely truthful in saying that it, all of this is Jacob's fault. He had willingly sold his birthright. And again, don't we kind of do that too? Don't we oftentimes like to make it the other guy's complete responsibility? Yeah, we do. And again, Esau is a great representative of humanity. And Isaac says, I have made him Lord over you and the rest of the family. I have nothing for you. And Esau says, please, Father, bless me. Just one little blessing. So what he received was kind of an anti-blessing. Because this is what Isaac said. You will live away from the fertility of the earth, away from the dew of heaven. Great. By your sword you will live and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. So Esau's uh, family, his, his descendants, occupied the land south and east-ish of Israel. So below Beersheba, below the Dead Sea. Do you all know where Petra is? Have you heard of Petra in Jordan? Have you seen pictures of Petra? The, 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 it's desert. That's where the Edomites lived. So when he's receiving this blessing, you're going to go somewhere where it's not very fertile and it doesn't rain very often. That's exactly where he went. And there will be conflict between Jacob's descendants and Esau's descendants for a really long time. 
And then we'll find in 2 Kings chapter 8 where the Edomites throw off the yoke of the children of Israel. So that was the anti-blessing that he got. God in his foreknowledge had said that the younger brother would rule the older brother, but does that mean that what Jacob did was right and honorable or that God condoned what he did? Y'all can say that a little bit louder. <laughs> if it was God's plan that Jacob would rule Esau, does that mean he had a plan? Did he need Rebecca and Jacob to move that plan along? No. When God said to Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child, did he have a plan? Did he need them to help him along with that plan? No. He didn't need Rebecca and Jacob to help him along. And again, don't we do that? We decide that God needs some help. And so we make things happen to make things happen when maybe we just need to sit there and wait. But we're not very good at sitting and waiting for God to act sometimes. So no, what Rebecca and Jacob did was sin in the eyes of God and make no mistake about that. And while God will certainly bless Jacob, he will not protect him from the consequences of his choices. Those consequences, like the blessing, will follow him for the rest of his life. He will experience deception when he goes to find a wife. He will watch his sons use deception and murder. The consequences of what he chose to do will haunt him the rest of his life. And God will not protect him from those choices. Esau's hands were not clean either, as we have already determined. But that didn't keep him now from being angry and resentful at what Jacob had done. He is so angry and resentful that he swears that after his father has died and after that period of mourning is over, his, his intent is to send Jacob to where Isaac was going, right? That was his plan. Jacob would not be far behind Isaac if Esau had anything to say about it. Did Esau have a right to be angry? Okay. Did he have the right to the conclusion he came to for solving? his anger problem, which was murdering his brother. Would, would that have solved anything? Would he have then gotten the birthright blessing by default because there's no other brother? Probably not. That's why the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't let anger, because anger in itself isn't sin, but what you allow anger to do turns into sin. And so Esau is angry, even though his hands were not clean in this situation. And Rebecca is told of Esau's plan, and so she sent for Jacob, and she says to him, your brother is planning to kill you. So do what I say. Leave here and go to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay there until Esau gets over his plans for revenge. When he is no longer angry, I will send word and you can come home. Do any of you know how long Jacob will spend with Laban? Fourteen 
Keep going. More than 14. 21. 20 years. He will spend from home. He will be away from home. So to Isaac, so she says, you know, son, get your stuff together and I'll go and I'll talk to daddy and we'll get this figured out. So she goes into Isaac and she says, I am totally and completely 100% disgusted with Esau's wives. Those Hittite women, I cannot stand them. And if Jacob marries Hittite wives, my life will not be worth living. She totally sounds like a Jewish mother. <laughs> totally sounds like a Jewish My life will be over. <laughs> so Isaac calls Jacob and he blesses him and he says, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go instead to the house of Bethuel, your, father, your mother's father, and take a wife from among the daughters of Laban, her brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful, and may you become a company of people. May he also give the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants that you may take possession of the land in which you are currently an alien and a stranger. The land he gave to Abraham, and so Isaac sent Jacob away. And the thing is, is that Jacob will never see his mother again. The death of Rebekah is not recorded in the Bible. But we, know, we do know two things. is That she died before Jacob returned home. And she was buried in the cave of Machpelah alongside Abraham and Sarah. So, he, so that was one of the consequences. He never saw her again. So he left Beersheba and headed for Haran, which was 630 miles away. And when Esau learned that Jacob was gone and that he had been blessed and instructed not to marry a Canaanite woman, he realized, it, it seemed, the way that it, it's written in the Bible, it seems like it only just dawned on him how his parents really felt about his wives, that they didn't really like Canaanite women. So what did he do? What did Esau do? When, he, when it dawned on him or when he learned that his parents didn't really like Canaanite women or his Canaanite wives, what did he do? He married another one. This time he married Mahala, the daughter of Ishmael. So we, we, again, we get a real understanding of the character of Esau. He, his fist was raised in rebellion practically from the day of his birth. Meanwhile, Jacob was on the run, and the Bible says that he stopped at a certain place. And we all know this story. He took a stone, and using it for a pillow, he lay down to sleep. So what do you suppose that he was thinking about? He's on the run. He has deceived his father. He has left the only home he's ever known. His brother is out to kill him. What do you think he's thinking about? Relief, Relief that he's not, that, not he, he, that he's out of Esau's, yeah. okay. I'm wondering if God doesn't like him anymore. Okay. Which, which comes through guilt, shame. Do you think he was afraid? This is probably the first time in his life he's ever really been alone. He's going somewhere where he's never been before. It's 600, it's approximately 630 miles away. But that's like taking your kid, putting him on an airplane, to Taiwan, where he's never been, the language that he doesn't speak, you kiss him on the forehead and you say, bye bye have a good time. He's not too bad, because you know he's going to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so he's probably afraid. He's probably, full, he's probably full of shame. He's probably full of regret. He's probably wondering, about this birthright blessing. 
Soon he was asleep and he had a dream, and it's a dream so famous that we sing about it to this day. Oh, Jacob's escalator. Yes. We all sang that song. If you grew up as a Christian kid in a Christian school, and I, I know especially in the Seventh-day Adventist environment, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, soldiers of the cross. <laughs> are you being silly? No. No, you've never heard it? We <laughs> don't Okay, let me, let me take a step back. In the U.S., did you sing it when you were a kid? Okay. So some of you didn't. All right, I, I'll accept that. So he lays down to sleep, and this is what the Bible says. He saw a ladder set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Above it stood Yahweh, and he said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. And all this time we've, we've been talking about the, the, the sort of rottenness of humans. And now we see in this story the grace and the mercy and the faithfulness of God. Jacob was surely not worthy of the covenant blessing. And yet Yahweh made the same promises to him that he had made to Abraham and Isaac. I am with you. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. I will bring you back to this land. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. He met Jacob where Jacob was. In his brokenness, in his shame, in his fear, in his failure of faith. And he promised to restore him. Sometimes we, well, more often than not, I guess I should say, we humans are not very gracious towards other humans. We see their failure of faith. Well, I wouldn't have done it that way. What's wrong with you? We add to their shame instead of seeking to heal. And yet, God took this broken man who was on the run because of choices that he had made, and he promised to restore him. And as Christ followers, or people who claim to be Christ followers, that should be what we are about to Because we've all had moments of faith failure. We've all had moments of fear. We've all had moments where we're ashamed, and maybe rightly so, we should be ashamed. But we can learn a lot by what Jesus, what Jesus did with Jacob and how we, too, should come and walk beside each other. When Jacob woke up, he was afraid, and he thought, surely Yahweh is in this place, and I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. In the morning, he took this stone pillow, and, and he set it straight up and, and created basically a pillar out of it, and he poured oil on it. And he called the place Bethel, and then he made a vow, and he said, because God has promised to be with me and watch over me on this journey, 
and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I am re will, so that I return safely to my father's house then Yahweh will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all that you give me I will give to you a tenth and so Jacob continued on his journey until he eventually came to the land of the eastern peoples and that's Jacob, the early years. So what do you all have to say? What can we learn from Jacob? What, what Jacob did, what, what Rebecca did, what Isaac did, what Esau did. What can we learn from them? And what can we also learn then from how God responded? Is there anything to learn? So many people say, well, what good is the, the Bible that was written 2,000 years ago? What kind, of, what kind of impact does it have on me? What can it teach me? just started over? Could he have gone, oh, for heaven's sakes. There's got to be somebody else on planet Earth that can do better than this. chooses to work through us in the same way even though we are flawed and we fail and we have moments where our faith doesn't even enter the picture. And yet he remains faithful. Why? Because he promised to. Lisa, did you have something that you wanted to? No. Okay. Anybody else? What can we learn from this story? I mean, I guess I do. It's not in, I, I just looked it up in scripture, not in scripture. But if you read about this story in Ellen White writings, yeah. when he lay down to sleep that night, his, the burden of his heart was, am I still right with God? The, the birthright more than the blessing was more important to him. And the birthright, which was to be the spiritual leader, the priest of the family type thing. And it, like you mentioned, God met him where he was at. So God heard the desire of his heart and said, I am here. Walk with me. I will walk with you. And I thought that was, that was pretty special. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Thoughts about this. We can learn stuff from the Old Testament because people have a change. Yeah. And I think despite all our flaws, you know, to say, God still knows how to say, you know, the promise that He kept, He knows how to steer us um, in the direction that that will uh, meet His promise. Um, so, you know, we can do crazy things, <laughs> and we always do. So, but you can hear, I mean, you can see from this story that it said, God really said, despite all that happens, He still guide us and then lead us to the final destination. Yeah. Good. Amy. Um, you know, knowing Rachel, loving Jacob, you know, her, her favorite or whatever. Rebecca. 
this happened, he might have married Hittite women, and, and, and you know, because that's the most closest people. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like you know. I don't know if she would have let him go necessarily if he did, she didn't have to. Yeah, that's maybe true. You know, when Paul writes, God works all things out. He has a plan, right? And he knows what that plan is. And yet he also knows humans and how weird and fickle we are. And yet he works within the plans that we make to accomplish his plan. Because ultimately his plan is Jesus, right? In this context, in the context of the Old Testament, his goal is Jesus. That through this family, Jesus is going to come. That's his ultimate goal, right? And so sometimes God bobs and sometimes he weaves because he knows the weird choices that we're going to make. And yet his goal remains the same and his plan remains the same. And yeah, Amy, I think you're probably right. If, if Jacob was her favorite, would she really have allowed him to leave except under duress? Maybe not. But God got Jacob where he needed to go. And so God is always, he's always working. He's always, that's my goal. My goal is that way. And sometimes we come over here. And sometimes we come over here. But we're still heading in this direction. Yeah. You know, you look at the story and it's just, oh, now, whatever, I, how messed up I, 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 I mean, whatever they do, just said, God still guide me in this direction. Now, are we going to see it that way, or said, um, said, okay, says, hey, this is a lesson we learned learn, uh, that um, even though, said, God, here, I'm going sideways to a narrow road, and said, God pulls me back and leads me the right path, um, said, if God is going to do that all the time, hey, it's okay, I can mess up. <laughs> but no, because... <laughs> you, you, can, you can sure go down that road. No, you sure he, could. He, but. he suffered so much, though. Mm -hmm. like yeah. There's consequences to our choices. Mm -hmm. Even though you could say that God will make things right, but it has, doesn't have to be that way. Well, if, but it does... You're right. Just because God is ultimately going to make it right in the end does not excuse us of the choices that we make. We are still accountable for those choices. And again, as we will see in the rest of Genesis, Jacob will pay a very high price for the choices that he makes. But yeah, I mean, it would be very easy to go, oh, what the, you know, I can do whatever I want because God's just going to pull me back in. No, it doesn't condone what we do. But God, God is ultimately gracious and patient and long suffering and will accomplish what he has promised to accomplish. So, next week it's Jacob the Exile Years. So, read up on that. And if anybody else has a question, a thought, a comment? No? All right. Well, let's stand up. Jesus. Sometimes it's it's hard to read these stories maybe a little bit because we see so easily our reflections in that mirror. And it's not a good look. Sometimes we think that you need some help and so we help you along the way and all we do is screw it up. And sometimes we get angry and, 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 and want to seek revenge, maybe not necessarily in murdering somebody, but seeking revenge in our own way for things that we are also responsible for. And it's not a good look. And yet through it all, you are there. Through it all, your promises remain secure. Through it all, 
you choose to walk beside us. You even choose to go down roads that you didn't choose for us to go down, and, and, and yet you remain a true and faithful God. May that really be the thing that we take from these stories, not the humans, because oh, for heaven's sakes, but how you choose to respond, how you choose to remain faithful. And we know, Lord, that because you did that 2,000 years ago, that you still do that today. And you will still do that in our lives as well. So I thank you for that, dear Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.